Und so Leute, let's go. Ich bin gespannt, ich will das Video sehen. Ist Zeit dann gesund. Uh, das ist... Uh, ma, warte mal. Das ist... Das ist doch Gluten, oder? Seitans zusammengepresstes Gluten. Also nicht sonderlich gesund, ne. Elke, pünktlich zum Reaktionsvideo. Also ich, ich meine, es ist jetzt höchstwahrscheinlich auch nicht ungesund. Es ist wahrscheinlich eher neutral. Aber es ist halt äh, einfach Gluten. Lieber Tofu. Tofu ist äh, garantiert gesund. Ja, aber es ist halt kein Weizen, denn da ist nur das Gluten, soweit ich weiß. Das ist ein Pro-Carb-Video, ja genau. Das ist der Typ, der seinen Typ 2 Diabetes geheilt hat mit einer fast äh, Sugar-Only-Diet. Und dann hat er daraus äh, eine Organisation gemacht, die Diabetes Typ 2 krank heilt. Robbie Barbara heißt er. Ich habe noch nie was von dem gesehen. Deswegen wollte ich mal was von dem gucken. Und das ist der, glaube ich. See you guys. Thank you for doing this. It's great to be here. You Appreciate too, so both of you and the, the work that you're doing. Um, very exciting. You got the book coming out soon, so you're making the rounds. Yes, Absolutely. sir. So I appreciate you taking time out to talk to me about all the stuff that you guys are up yeah. to. It's cool. Um, and Cyrus, you you live in. Ja, den ohne Haare, den Typ, den kennt man, ne? Der taucht immer mal wieder auf in Dokus, vegan Dokus. In Costa Rica. That's right. Yeah, I've been in Costa Rica what's, now for two years. What's, what, what is the deal with that? So my wife and I went to Costa Rica for our honeymoon. Uh -huh. And while we were there, uh, we had just had like this idea that like maybe it would be fun to live outside the United States one day. Uh -huh. And then when we started talking with people, we got introduced to this whole network of expats that live there. And the overwhelming feeling from the expats that we had talked to were like, if you don't move here, you're making a big mistake. And we were like, wait, why are people so like <laughs> such strong conviction about uh -huh. this, right? And then we met a real estate agent and he said, oh, you could live over here on the beach and here's a condo, here's a house, here's up on the hill, you name it. Computer all day long. There's a whole collection of people that are from the United States that moved down there. We can make this <laughs> That's work. That's key, yeah. All right, okay. So, I grew up in Palo Alto, California. Wenn jetzt noch einer Hilfe flex schreibt, Permaban, ey. You went to Palo Alto High, right? I went to Palo Alto High. Ich hab mich versprochen, okay? And went to Stanford as well, mm -hmm. just like you. And, You're like um, half my age, but go ahead. <laughs> What year did you graduate? 89. You 89. weren't even... Then you're doing, go to the hospital right now. Or go to the health center. And I was like, why? What's happening? And she's like, you, you have type 1 diabetes, and that's what you're explaining to me. And I would oh, ich höre nichts. Draußen ist ein Flugzeug. Herrgott, nochmal. Kein Wort verstanden. It's like, Schnaz, come on. I, was, I don't have diabetes. One gallon, one and a half, two gallons of water a day, just kind of out of the blue. I was urinating all the time. So I would go to the bathroom like clockwork every 30 minutes. So I picked up the phone and called my sister after like 48 hours of... of okay, der sagt gerade... Der sagt gerade, dass er immer pinkeln musste. So viel hat er gar nicht getrunken, so viel musste er pinkeln. Das ist äh, Anzeichen dafür, dass du äh, Diabetes Typ 2 hast, weil der Körper, äh, du hast Zucker im Urin und deswegen musst du ständig pinkeln, weil der Körper muss das loswerden. Going through this and she's a doctor of osteopathy. And I said, hey, Shanaz, here's my symptoms, what is happening to me? And she's normally pretty calm under pressure and she just, she just lost it. She just started crying right away and she was like, please just drop everything you're doing, go to the hospital right now or go to the health center. And I was like, why? What's happening? And she's like, you, you have type 1 diabetes. And that's what you're explaining to me. Oh, type 1 diabetes. And I was like, Schnaz, come on. I, was, I don't have diabetes. Don't be silly. Don't be, you know, how can that be possible? I'm like, I'm normal weight. I exercise. I think I eat well. And she's like, you don't understand. At that time, I literally thought that diabetes had something to do with old people and cake. That's mm -hmm. literally all I thought about. Right. And so I was like, all right, let me go to the health center. Show up at the health center half an hour later. 
test my blood glucose, and it's 600, a little higher than 600. Mm. So for and context. Nor- and normal range, we were just talking about this because you just tested and you were at 77. Normal range Correct. is between 70 and 130? 70, 130, exactly. That's what's considered. So sort of like... 600 Zucker hatte der. Das habe ich noch nie gehört, ey. You know, normal range. So if we tested your blood glucose at any moment in time, either before a meal or after a meal, you would likely be within that 70 to 130 range. And that's good because you're sort of your pancreas and liver are making sure that you stay in that physiologically normal range. I was six times higher than that. And so at that point, I was like, wow, I don't really understand what's happening. They took me to the hospital. They started giving me an IV of saline in one arm, IV of insulin in the other arm. And over a 24-hour period, they monitored my blood glucose by giving me insulin and they dropped my blood glucose to a safe level, Mm -hmm. and then they discharged me. So while I was in the hospital, they pieced together my health history that I wasn't able to do before that. And they said, hey, by the way, you don't have, you have not one, not two, but three autoimmune conditions. And I was like, wait, what? And they said, yeah, you have Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, which had set in six months prior. Uh, You also have alopecia universalis, which is why I have no hair, no eyebrows. Did you have no hair at that time? I was losing my hair at that time. Oh. Deswegen hatte keine Haare. Oh. Oh, jetzt verstehe ich. That so, had to be confusing. Oh, extremely confusing. I mean, I remember, I, I, I was seeing sh- pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Deswegen hatte auch keine Augenbrauen. It was weird. So you must have known something was up. For sure, when for you sure. called your sister, like, something's not right, my hair's falling out. Exactly right. My, but- my eyebrows are... Yeah, like I was getting these little ball patches in the back of my head and then it kind of like spread to the front of my head and a little bit on my like chest hair as well. Uh Um, But the doctors at that time, before they arrived at the conclusion that it was alopecia, were treating me for ringworm. And so they were giving me steroid injections directly into my head thinking that if they they did that, it would stimulate hair growth. And I went for some of those injections and my God, was it painful. Wow. So they said, okay, you have Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. Not falsche Behandlung bekommen, okay. Hypothyroidism, alopecia universalis, and then number three, type 1 diabetes. By the way, we've never seen anybody with this combination of autoimmune conditions ever before. You have what's called a polyglandular autoimmune syndrome. Uh, Can we talk about you at our next huddle? And I was like, "Uh, okay. So they didn't really instill me with much confidence. Mm -hmm. And they were being honest with me, and that's all I could ask, right? So, And what have you learned? Sorry to interject, but like, what have you learned... um, <clears throat> in the years since about the relationship between those three things like what what kind of confluence of events or what was happening biomechanically inside of you that mm-hmm. led to all three of those manifesting at the same time yeah it's a great question actually so as far as alopecia universalis is concerned um i haven't i haven't found too strong of a sort of like dietary connection or like what could actually trigger that but there is a strong axis between hashimoto's hypothyroidism type 1 diabetes and celiac disease. So patients that present with one often can present with another in that group. Uh Das stimmt. Autoimmunerkrankungen, äh, da ist es sehr wahrscheinlich, dass man im Laufe des Lebens eine weitere dazu bekommt. Schon fast garantiert. Weil dein System nun mal schon aus dem Ruder gelaufen ist. Also per Wissenschaft ist das so. Wer eine hat, der kriegt auch die nächste. And so there's a lot of people that we know who are living with type 1 diabetes as well as uh, Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, and that seems to be a really common occurrence. Um, some of it could be diet-induced. Some of it can be induced by a virus. Um, some of it can be induced by potential pathogens inside of food. Mm-hmm. And so there's, there's a whole collection. Like the, the, the type 1 diabetes research base is constantly searching for us uh, an answer. It's like, what causes type 1 diabetes? What... And, and there's, there's some strong evidence that there's multiple environmental triggers, but there's really no smoking gun at this point. And I don't, I don't necessarily know there ever will be. Right. Point being, they give me this diagnosis of three. They discharge me from the hospital. Blood glucose meter, two types of insulin, test strips, uh, carbohydrate counting guide, a life alert bracelet, and a, bo- a box of syringes. And they're wow. like, see you later. And as far as the hair is concerned, just forget about it. Yeah, they had no answers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Luckily, I did have a friend who, uh, who I was eating dinner with him at some point around that time. And he was like, hey, Cyrus, no offense, but uh, your hair looks weird. And I was like, I got you. I got you, Ari. And he's like, um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to finish dinner. 
We're going to drive to the store. I'm going to get a Bic razor. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Did you yeah. just decide to shave it? Yeah. yeah. And he was like, I'm just going to get rid of your hair tonight. And I was like, game, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. There's few people that can wear it as well. As I know. It looks good on you. Yeah, fitness YouTuber. And this is business. Nix anderes. They machen nichts anderes außer business. Juice nehmen, groß werden und dann Zeug verkaufen und sagen, ihr werdet so groß wie ich mit dem Zeug. Punkt. Unendliche Geldmaschine. Yeah, you, ro you definitely rock it well. I appreciate it. But yeah. see, at the time, I didn't know, right? Because I had hair and I was like, oh, if I get rid of this, this is a gamble, yeah. right? So uh, get discharged and, and, you know, like I had all those physical, you know, medical electronic devices, plus insulin, syringes, test strips, you name it. And then what I didn't expect was that I was going to also be discharged with a bunch of fear. So I go return to my normal life. You know, I have like six months left of school and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I literally don't know what to do. I don't know what to eat. I don't know when to exercise. I don't know how much insulin to give myself. This is literally just like a guess and check game, mm. I guess. They didn't give you any sort of counseling or somebody who could help kind of, you know, mentor you through that aspect of it? They, they gave me some light recommendations and they, they have this sort of, you know, inject this much insulin if your blood glucose is doing this. It's called a sliding scale. You know, and it's like it's like a generalized set of recommendations that are all based off of, you know, what is your glucose right now? And it's just like it's just it's just not that helpful. Let's put it that way. Right. And so I got that. Plus, I also got this idea of like, you should eat a low carbohydrate diet. And I was like, mm -hmm. why would I do that? They said, well, when you eat more carbohydrates, your blood glucose will go up and your, your insulin use will go up. So so the harmless, no? Sehr, sehr geil. Da hat er es gerade gesagt. Da hat er gerade alles gesagt hä? über Ärzte, über die Krankheit. Ärzte empfehlen ihm bei Diabetes Low Carb, weil Kohlenhydrate pieken dann Insulin. Da haben wir es. So ist es. Und das erzählt mir jeder Diabetiker. A simple way to not have that happen is to reduce your carb is doing this. It's called a sliding scale, you know, and it's like it's like a generalized set of recommendations that are all based off of, das will ich noch mal hören. you know, what is your glucose right now? And it's just like it's just it's just not that helpful. Let's put ah. it that way. It's not halber, ne? And so I got that. Plus, I also got this idea of like, you should eat a low carbohydrate diet. And I was like, mm -hmm. why would I do that? They said, well, when you eat more carbohydrates, your blood glucose will go up and your insulin use will go up. So a simple way to not have that happen is to reduce your carbohydrate intake and then you can keep your glucose controlled and you can keep your insulin controlled. And I said, cool, sounds good. That's the hundredprozentige Gegenteil von der Wahrheit. Jetzt oh, bin ich uh, innerlich uh, am Kochen von sowas. So... I started eating. Und das sagen dir, das sagen dir Diabetologen, Leute. A lower carbohydrate diet. More turkey burgers for breakfast, egg. Also er hat's gemacht sogar, okay. Genau, kann man allgemein nicht heilen. Uh, black forest ham sandwiches for lunch with, you know, small amount of bread. Uh, I'd have some fish for dinner, small amounts of rice. And I was just really trying to focus on like eating more fat and protein rich foods and eating less carbohydrate because that's what my doctor told me. Ka no. So da habe ich da jetzt drauf gedrückt. Äh, da habt ihr es gehört. Die Empfehlung von seinem Arzt und der hat's gemacht und niemals vergessen, Kohlenhydrate sind Pflanzen. For the first year of my life with diabetes, I supposed to make my glucose more controllable. It didn't. Not at all. Oh, es hat nicht funktioniert. Low Carb hat nicht funktioniert. Und jetzt bitte den äh, Arzt ins Gefängnis stecken. My blood glucose meter, which you saw me using just before this. Right. What it does is you use it every day, multiple times a day, and it's it's an indicator of whether where your glucose is, so you can use that to make decisions. And so what was supposed to happen is my glucose is supposed to stay within that 80 to 130 range. Wie können Menschen, die keine Ärzte sind, so wie ich oder wie ihr oder wie er das besser wissen als der Diabetologe. Wie kann so etwas sein? Es ist so krank, es ist so krank. 
for a majority of the day. And if it goes higher, comes a little boss. Low, I can do something about it. But on a given day, my glucose was 40, 210, 120, 280, 64. Just bouncing up, down, up, okay. down, up, down. A and random number generator. Literally a random number <laughs> generator. And when you're dealing with, if you've, I don't know if you've ever, you've probably never experienced a glucose higher than like 140 or 160 is my guess. Because you're non-diabetic and that's a good thing. But when your blood glucose goes high, it feels terrible. It feels really terrible. What is, what is that experience? So for me, I feels like it feels like my head is a balloon. Like it's kind of expanded and it's very large. I get a taste of metal inside my mouth. And my nose starts to feel like it's it's larger than it really is. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of feels like my head is swelling. It's got a lot of pressure inside of it. And I get really thirsty. Uh, when your glucose is low... Or ja, die entstehen durch... Es hat auch mit Leaky Gut zu tun, weil das Protein, tierische Protein, so, so ins Blut kommt. Aber es kommt vom tierischen Protein, ja. Or when my glucose is low, you get the opposite, which is, is sort of... Like you basically, your brain is sort of being starved for glucose temporarily. And so it leads to shaky hands, some slurred speech. Uh, sometimes you see little like black spots in your vision. Mm -hmm. um, you can get this diaphoretic sweating, uh, and it's just kind of this like. Ja, und Tazukat kenne ich auch, ja. Als Fleischesser bin ich einmal und Tazukat hat genau die Symptome. Panic mode, and then all of a sudden your appetite mm -hmm. increases, and you want to eat everything that you. Panic mode, das trifft sehr sehr gut, sehr sehr gut. You can see. Mm -hmm. So, you know, bouncing between hyper, hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia on a daily basis, just like, it sucks all the mental energy out of you. Right. It just takes it away. And you must have been thinking that, <clears throat> well, I just need to perfect how I'm doing this, right? Like, clearly, like, I'm just, I'm an amateur. And if I can just figure out, you know, if I can read the signals of my body right. and, and regulate my insulin intake and pay more attention to when I'm eating and what I'm eating, that I can get this, like, dialed in. Exactly right. And like I, I was trained as an engineer, as a mechanical engineer in college. And, you know, that training basically teaches you how to com control very complex systems that have multiple moving parts, right. you know, into something that's very controllable. So you right? got spreadsheets out. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to figure this out. Yeah. And I'm like, come on, this is not there's not that many variables. Let's control this. And this is literally the one system I could not control. Again, I didn't have a degree in biology. I didn't really know that much. But I think that's a slow carb, you know, you know, that's a slow carb. Figured I could try and control the system. And why was I wrong? So it all kind of came to a tipping point. One day I had gone to work in the morning. I had played a game of soccer at lunch for an hour. I had worked out in the morning before work. I had eaten a low carbohydrate diet. Mm -hmm. And then I got home at like five o'clock p.m. to go to uh, to eat dinner. So I checked my blood glucose in preparation for eating dinner, and I was hoping that it would be in range. Give me a 120, a 130, and then that I can inject a normal amount of insulin. Ja, ich bin auch gespannt. Voll spannend. Voll spannend. I eat my dinner and go to sleep. I checked my glucose, and it was like 288. Mm. And I got so frustrated because, again, I was doing everything that I was, was supposed to do. And so I just, got, I just got filled with this just anxious rage, and I just picked up my glucose meter, and I just threw it across the room and it just hit the wall and shattered. And then I just sunk into the couch and I just started crying. And I was just like, I was so frustrated that I couldn't figure this out. And it was in that moment where I, I literally heard a voice inside of my head and the voice said, Cyrus, just learn how to eat. You don't know anything about nutrition. Learn how to eat and your life will fundamentally change for the better. And I was like, okay, this is this is my calling. This is me. This I, is this your is message from God. Literally, yeah. And, and you're like, and I probably should get a new glucose meter. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the next day, I basically started looking for more information. I started getting recipe books. I started, you know, viewing videos online and talking to people. One thing led to another, and I got interested. Ja, den Gedanken muss man erstmal kriegen ohne Witz. Du this guy named Doug Graham. Mm -hmm. So Doug Graham, when I met him. Um, he basically was the only person I knew that was confident in talking to a person with type 1 diabetes because type 1 diabetes is considered like a, a like dangerous enough condition or like a, a, a nuanced enough condition that most health practitioners, you know, are sort of like, oh, like I don't really know how to handle insulin. It's kind of dangerous. But Doug was like, listen, come under my wing. I'll, t I'll show you exactly what to do. So I go to a retreat that he's hosting and under his guidance, he basically says, listen, I'm going to transition you 
to a diet that's basically lots of fruit, lots of vegetables. And we're going to temporarily, while you're here, we're going to give up meat, cheese, chicken, fish, and high fat. Also, der ist auf einen Typen gestoßen, der heißt Doug Graham, okay? Und äh, der dreht ihm die Ernährung jetzt einfach mal komplett in die andere Richtung. Mal sehen, was passiert. Foods in general. I said, okay, great, let's do this. And he said, your glucose is going to become a lot more controlled. Also, eine High Carb Diet, ne? der hundertprozentige Switch, komplettes Umdrehen der Makronährstoffe, okay? Well, but I want you to feel it. So, over the course of that seven days, what happened to my blood glucose was mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing. Oh, hör mal einer an. Uh, I went into it with again really highly variable blood glucose, a lot of insulin use. Um, in the first 24 hours of being there, my blood glucose fell so dramatically that I hit six hypoglycemias, five to six hypoglycemias, back to back to back to back. And I was like, I hadn't felt that in a long time. Hypo, ne? Also, zu niedrig. Uh, as a result of that, I had to start backing off on the amount of insulin I was dosing myself. Okay, das heißt, wenn, dein, wenn du immer wieder unten den Boden berührst, dann muss, musst du weniger Insulin nehmen. Okay. And then that got better by day two, by day three, by day four. By the time day seven had rolled around, I had cut my insulin use by 35 to 40 percent. And okay, nach sieben Tagen hat er uh, 30 Prozent weniger Insulin genommen. Okay. <lacht> Erzähl das mal dem Arzt. Erzähl das mal deinem Diabetologen. Und dann guckt ihr mal sein Gesicht an. Ey. The kicker in this whole thing was that it wasn't, I wasn't calorie restricting. I wasn't I wasn't not eating food in order to reduce my insulin use. On the keine Kalorienrestriktion hatte gemacht, wisst du? Contrary, I was eating more food than I'd ever eaten before. Er hat mehr gegessen als jemals zuvor. <lacht> das hundertprozentige Gegenteil, was euch jeder Diabetologe empfiehlt. Ja, du musst weniger essen, die Hälfte essen, Kalorienrestriktion, Low Carb, Blutzucker, nicht spiken. Ja, da macht alles hundertprozentig gegenteilig. And I was eating more carbohydrate rich food than mm -hmm. I'd ever eaten before. More fruits, more vegetables. I mean, I kid you not, I was eating plates with like six to eight bananas on them. With ah, six to eight bananas as diabetica. Ah. With persimmons and grapes and papayas and mangoes. And I was like, you, how is it that I'm eating all this food, but I'm using less insulin? That doesn't make sense. Das, um, das ist halt die Frage aller Fragen. Wie kann es sein, dass ich jetzt. Sachen esse, Bananen, 98% Kohlenhydrate und ich brauche weniger Insulin, 40% weniger. Wie kann das sein? Das ergibt keinen Sinn. Ja, aber wenn die Krankheit, Krankheit verstehst, ergibt das verdammt Sinn. Das ist das Einzige, was nur passieren kann. Makes sense. And it kind of put this in context. First, was für ein geiles Video, ey. First of all, you know, Doug Graham, widely known for, for being a proponent of what he calls the 80-10-10 diet. Exactly right. Ratio of oh, das ist der 80-10-10 Typ. Ich kenne den nicht, den Doug Graham. Ich kenne den nicht. Ich habe den schon mal gehört, aber... Crows, 80% carbohydrates, 10% fat, 10% um, protein. <clears throat> And this, you know, in, in terms of type 1 diabetes, this is anathema. Like, you, this contravenes... The medical establishment or you that somebody with your condition should be eating a low carbohydrate diet instead he's putting you on this very high carbohydrate regimen which mm -hmm. basically flies in the face of everything that you've been told prior. exactly right so the conventional wisdom would be that if you're eating this much fruit that this is going to make your your blood glucose skyrocket and make this more difficult to control exactly. and require more insulin yes yeah so my insulin and use so, had been creeping. And, 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 and so, yeah, just to put a pin in it, the, mm -hmm. the, the experience that you had was, was diametrically opposed to that. It was the opposite. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, my insulin use had been in increasing over the course of time. From the time I was first diagnosed, I was using like mid-20s. And then it became 32, 36, 37, 41, 43. There were times where I was injecting 45 to 50 units of insulin per day on this low-carbohydrate diet. And now Auf low-carb 50 Einheiten Insulin pro Tag. Hat er gespritzt. Now I'm faced with the prospect of eating boatloads of fruit and I'm doing some mental math and I'm like, oh, 50 is going to turn into 70, is going to turn into 120. That seems like a lot of insulin, but instead 50 turned into 
26, 27, 32 units of insulin per day. Ja, yeah, and we're... Mm -hmm. 20, 23, 26 mit High Carb. <lacht> Die Hälfte. We're going to talk about why that is. We're going to get into the weeds on... Niemals vergessen, er hat Typ 1, ne? Bei Typ 2 sieht es nochmal ein bisschen anders aus. Da fällt es ja auf 0. Ja, yeah, we can geek out there. Um, und seine Schild äh, seine, Schild seine Bauchspeicheldose ist futsch, deswegen wird er immer Insulin spritzen müssen. Niemals vergessen. And I but I also think it's worth mentioning like Doug Graham, you know, he's not without controversy himself. Like, this guy is like, you know, he's gotten into trouble with these fasting retreats and, you know, people going a little bit too far with this stuff, right? Yeah. And, and to, to yeah. be clear, you know, we're not advocating that exact approach in what we've written in the book and the science right. we're citing right. it's it's a, it's a bit different he kind of like sparked our journey right yeah. yeah i got it i got it yeah to yeah. give doug the credit that he's uh -huh. due doug fundamentally changed my life no questions right. asked and like you know if it wasn't for doug i wouldn't have been introduced to this at that point in my life and it wouldn't have like allowed me to start changing my life for the uh -huh. better and then going on to learn more about it so i got to give him the credit right. that he's due and as you know the bauchspeicheldose is kaputt weil der körper die selbst angegriffen hat weil er tierisches Protein gegessen hat und die hat dieselbe Aminosäurestruktur wie die Bauchspeicheldrüse. Um genauer zu sein, die Beta-Zellen auf der Bauchspeicheldrüse in Form von menschlichem Beta-Casein. Und er hat tierisches Beta-Casein gegessen, was dem menschlichen sehr, sehr ähnlich ist. Und äh, so hat der Körper das tierische Beta-Casein angegriffen und seins auch. Ne, das ist äh, Cross-Reaction nennt man das, Molecular Mimicry. Und dann äh, hat seine Bauchspeicheldose äh, zerschossen. Deswegen wird er immer Insulin brauchen. As an engineer, this must have blown your mind a little bit. A hundred percent. It was it was fascinating to me. So I I leave this retreat. Genau so funktioniert jede Autoimmunerkrankung. Hm? I was so fascinated by what I learned that I just went straight to the books and I just started reading everything I possibly could. Ah. Started accessing the literature, reading textbooks, you name it. Then I enrolled in school to go learn. Organic chemistry, biochemistry, nutritional biochemistry. And then at a certain point I said, you know what, I think I want to... Mein Gott, wie sehe ich aus? Warum er Proteine angreift, weil die im Körper nichts verloren haben. Die dürfen dort nicht sein. Es dürfen keine äh, Schweineproteine in deinem Blut schweben. Der greift die an. Der kennt die auch äh, zum Teil als Pathogen an. Also muss er sie wie Pathogene bekämpfen. Und deswegen ne, vernichtet er Fremdproteine, außer Pflanzen. Ne? <lacht> Die greift er nicht an, weil du bist ein Pflanzenfresser. Und deswegen ne, haben die Menschen, guck dir die Studien an über m, Schilddrüsenerkrankungen zum Beispiel, oder mein Video, ich habe die Studie besprochen. Äh, die Veganer haben die niedrigsten Wahrscheinlichkeiten dafür, weil die das wenigste Fremdprotein essen. Actually get a PhD degree in this. So I applied to schools, I got into UC Berkeley, and then I was there for five years to learn nutritional biochemistry so that I could, I could talk science about my own personal experience. But the motivation... Okay, also der hat das ja dann gelernt auch. Ne? Also der ist... Ihn hat das so das Leben gerettet, dass er hinging und äh, das gelernt hat. ...to get your PhD was, was fueled entirely by your own experience. Genau. Fueled entirely by my own experience, but but it was endless, yeah, endless. To ask a bigger question, and the question was, am I a freak of nature? That's literally what I wanted to learn, because if this was something that only applied to me, and I was just some. Weil der Körper kann nicht exakt dieses Protein oder der Körper macht Antikörper, um das Protein zu bekämpfen, aber da jedes Protein eine andere Struktur hat, also einen anderen Aminosäurecode, ja, so gesagt. Uh, kommt ein Protein ins Blut, das wird vom Körper gescannt, schickt das an die, uh, an die um, Immunzellen und die haben dann diesen Code, so gesagt, gespeichert und suchen im Körper nach diesem Code, um den zu vernichten, dieses Protein. Verstehst du? Aber sie haben nicht genau diesen Code, weil es sind viele Proteine und deswegen gibt es eine ungefähr diesen Code. Ja, ein bisschen auch ähnlich diesem Code und ähnlich diesem Code, so dass sie dem Code ähneln damit er alle Proteine kriegt. Verstehst du? Und das Problem ist, diese Cross-Reaction, ne, dass er das kreuzt, um sicher zu gehen, dass er alles kriegt, kreuzt er auch das menschliche Protein. Weil 
du hast Säugetierprotein gegessen, du bist ein Säugetier. Ne? Das ist das Problem. Das ist voll interessant, ja. Really interesting end of one experiment. Okay, fine. Und das ist das, was die Wissenschaft zeigt. Und das weiß der anscheinend nicht. Hat er ja am Anfang gesagt, er weiß nicht, wovon Diabetes über 1 kommt. Wow, mal gucken die Wissenschaft. Ich weiß es, weil es in der Wissenschaft steht. I get it. But if, if what I was experiencing could also be applied to other people living with type 1 or pre-diabetes or type 2, now you have a much bigger story. Right. And so ja, mit Typ 2 Diabetes wäre es viel interessanter, aber vielleicht wird der andere noch äh, zu Typ 2 was sagen, wie man dann auf 0 kommt. Ja, 0, das heißt komplett Reversal. So, while I was at school, I started to understand the science of blood glucose control and diabetes and insulin resistance. And while I was there, I started to realize that, that there is almost a hundred years of science that clearly describes the phenomenon that I was experiencing. And that hundred years of science is actually one of the most powerful solutions that, that we've ever found for... Habt ihr gehört? 100 Jahre, seit 100 Jahren weiß man das. Seit 1926 etwa. Huh. Treating this thing called diabetes in all forms and you know can really be applied to large numbers of people with phenomenal results that being the case then why is this not the conventional dogma today in terms of treating diabetes i mean this is yeah. the big question yeah. right As a warum das nicht uh, warum sie das nicht wissen big business big pharma uh, diabetes medikamente sind ein multimilliardengeschäft and this is why you money 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 do what you do and why you write your book absolutely yeah i mean i I wish we had the, the exact answer to that. I, mean, a lot of I think part of the problem here is that uh, doctors are not trained to, uh, they're not trained in nutrition, first of all. So they go through medical... <laughs> Was ich euch gerade erzählt habe, ist, ein Arzt hat nichts mit Ernährung zu tun. Ein Arzt und Ernährung komplett, wie ein Arzt und hier, wie man Schränke zusammenbaut, lernen. Die haben nichts miteinander zu tun, ein Arzt und Ernährung. Ne? Das ist äh, ein Widerspruch in sich, aber das ist die Realität. Das sagt jeder Arzt, McDougal, Barnard, alle sagen das. Auf der Bühne, Gregor. Medical school, you know, they go through four years of medical school plus a residency plus a fellowship. Sometimes that can be almost a decade worth of schooling. And you ask your average doctor, hey, how much nutrition do you learn? And they're like, eh, I don't know. I learned one class, one day, maybe six hours. Sechs Stunden Ernährung im uh, Medizinstudium. Nice. Right, and there's studies that actually show that your average doctor learns right. nutrition for a maximum of 20 to 25 hours mm -hmm. while they're in med school. So they're 20 bis 25 Stunden Ernährungsunterricht als Arzt maximal per Studien belegt. Ja, ja. Just not given the training to talk about food. And it's not their fault because doctors are phenomenal human beings and they go into it with altruistic tendencies. But they're just not given the right tool set. Mm -hmm. So they leave medical school, they go into their practice, and then when they when somebody with diabetes or high cholesterol or hypertension presents to them, their solution is like, well, I, I have this pill that I you know can prescribe for you because that's the system that I know how to do. Right. And yeah. so I think that's a huge problem, and then it sort of makes it so that people living with diabetes don't really have dietary options when they go talk to a dietitian who's been trained in a much more traditional setting, their answer is low carbohydrate. So you're getting, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you're I mean, that's part of the confusion around mm -hmm. diabetes. It's one of the few chronic conditions you can monitor on a meal-by-meal -meal basis. You Correct. can look at your yeah, you're own constantly getting meter. feedback all day long. You're right. getting data. And, and like you said, we're going to get into the weeds on, you know, the, the cause and what's going on here. But yes, it's true. If you do a low-carbohydrate diet, you will see better numbers. You'll see flatline blood glucose, blood glucose on your CGM. So there is particular confusion in diabetes that is very nuanced. And that is part of the reason I think this approach has not caught on yet because mm -hmm. people don't understand the confusion of the headlines and the studies that are being cited. Just a lot of misinformation. So Cyrus, when you're getting your PhD and you're, you're digging deep into this stuff and you're uncovering these studies that date back decades and decades, was this, and, and when you would kind of present this to your colleagues or you know, whoever you were working with at the time, were they on board with what you were finding and kind of the path that you were blazing or are they were they more on the conventional path of like hey this isn't really the way we do this no no they they were very supportive actually mm -hmm. because you know whether it was talking to other graduate students or whether it was talking to my advisor um or even some of the other professors you know 
I would be explaining the results of the research. So it was like, you know, my story was one thing. Okay, fine. It's an anecdotal experience. It makes sense. But then when you translate that and you start to get the same results in laboratory animals because that's the, the, what you're supposed to be doing in graduate school, you know, we were running a whole collection of experiments to induce insulin resistance in mice using dietary methods and then reverse that using either intermittent fasting or diet or exercise. That's a guy like, what the fuck? So we were, and the way that you induce a diabetic response in an animal is to is to put them on a pretty high fat diet, right? So, so that was another yeah. epiphany for me, right? I'm sitting here with you know tasked with the with the objective of trying to make animals insulin resistant so that we can use them as a testing ground. And when I started looking in the literature, I was like, how do I make an animal insulin resistant? Okay, I probably got to give them a high fructose diet or high mm, that's stimmt. sucrose diet. Uh, and so I was looking in the literature with that preconceived notion and then it would i would read you know uh we induced insulin resistance in laboratory animals by feeding them a diet containing 70 saturated fat uh for eight weeks we induced insulin resistance we induced type 2 diabetes in laboratory animals you know by feeding them a high fat diet high fat diet high fat diet and i was like this is unreal no sister die haben es in mäusen hervorgerufen immer mit einer high fat diet also low carb Low Carb heißt ja High Fat. Und die Ärzte haben ihm empfohlen, eine High Fat Low Carb Diet gegen Diabetes. Wie kann so etwas sein, Leute? You feed animals a High Fat Diet and they develop diabetes? Why is it that when, when in, the, in the public, when you say the word diabetes, the first association with the people makers is sugar, right? right? Yeah, I had Neil Bernard on the podcast. I, I just put an episode up with him last night, but I had did a previous episode with him where we talked a lot about this and yeah. people went crazy. They're like, that can't be true. Because he was talking about the real cause of this condition is people eating too much fat. Yeah, 100%. And that it's just, yeah, that, that flies in the face of everything that you thought that you knew. About. The disconnect between the research and what the public believes and understands is mind boggling. It's, it's massive. It's mind-boggling, du sagst es, eh? Absolutely mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. All right, so you have this epiphany. <clears throat> so I had this epiphany, and then, um, you know, I, I, start, I start to realize, okay, wait a minute. The high-fat diet that leads to insulin resistance, insulin resistance being the underlying cause of pre-diabetes, mm -hmm. pre-diabetes being the underlying cause of type 2 diabetes, right? The, the stepwise progression is person develops insulin resistance, They then progress to prediabetes. They then progress to type 2 diabetes. That affects 90% of the diabetes population, right? Type 1s like Robbie and I are like 8 to 10% of the population. Mm -hmm. Und das auch Typ 1. Mm -hmm. So that story, I was like, wait a minute. Okay, so, so does this mean that it could be that people who are eating high-fat diets in the real world are actually developing a state of insulin resistance that can then progress to type 2 diabetes themselves? And the answer is absolutely, because these studies have also been done in humans and the way to induce insulin resistance in a human being, which we'll get into a thousand times more detail, is by feeding them a high fat diet. Right. In terms of the statistics, obviously there's been an explosion in the incident. Also in Studien, wie man, kriegt man Menschen insulinresistent, indem man ihnen Fett füttert? Ganz genau, das ist das, was ich auch immer zeige. <laughs> Of, of type 2 is it similar with type das, was die Wissenschaft zeigt type 1 or is that remained kind of a stable data point that's a that's a phenomenal question actually it's growing it's growing yeah, yeah. over the past 10 years there's been a 23% increase in type 1 diabetes and this is the first time in human history that we've ever seen that mm. and so scientists are really th shrugging their shoulders and throwing up their hands and they're saying we don't know why because type 1 diabetes has historically only affected the same proportion of the population so as the population grows, the proportion of the population stays flat. But now we're actually seeing an increase in the, in the proportion of the population that's diagnosed with autoimmune conditions in general, type 1 diabetes for sure. And, uh, you know, who knows why that's happening. Right. So type 1 is essentially, they're still trying to figure out what, what the kind of initial cause of this is. But essentially, your pancreas just stops functioning properly and it's not secreting insulin. Yeah, so, so uh, for clarity, your pancreas basically has many, many, many functions. So there's what's called an exocrine function and an endocrine function. So the exocrine function is 
is what 99% plus of your pancreas is, require, is, is occupied doing. And that exocrine function is to make digestive hormones, I'm sorry, digestive enzymes, such that when you eat food, you can digest that food. These are like amylases, these are, these are hydrases, these are proteases, these are lipases, right? The other 1% of your, of, of your pancreas has, is endocrine. Endocrine be, meaning it's the, these cells secrete hormones into your blood, and then those travel to various tissues to elicit their biological effect. Mm -hmm. So the beta cells are part of these things called islets, clusters, and the beta cells are responsible for making insulin. And so those guys secrete insulin into your blood, and when you develop type 1 diabetes, the autoimmune reaction is effectively your own immune system that has been sort of tricked or hijacked into believing and 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 targeting beta cells for destruction. Hmm, da sagt er genau das, was ich eben erzählt habe. <laughs> so your own immune system is manufacturing antibodies that basically go and they they target proteins on the cell surface of beta cells and they end up disabling those beta cells. Right. So you end up losing. Hey, Goofy. Ja, erzählt der erzählt gerade eins zu eins, was ich euch eben erzählt habe. Wir gucken hier gerade äh, dieses diesen Podcast übelst interessant und äh, ja, der erzählt hier sowas von die Wahrheit, das ist einfach nur crazy. Elke, wie findest du das Video? Insulin production and as a result of that, 99 plus percent of your pancreas is functioning just fine. It's that one percent that's not crazy, ja? Huh? Functioning and all of a sudden that's mein hier wird eigentlich genau das erzählt, was ich immer sage, was ich in meinen Videos erzähle, eins zu eins. Fertig mit Kochen, das ist nice. Was, was ist, isst du denn? Erzähl mal. Ich habe auch gerade gegessen. Hier wieder Marogena. Marogena. Heißt das auf Russisch? Nur Vegan 7 weiß, was das heißt. That's not recoverable. Right, got it. Okay. Um, before we get too far into this, but we, Robbie, we got to hear your, your version of this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Spaghetti. Oh, lecker. Yeah. So when I was 12 years old, I had the same symptoms Cyrus had. I was thirsty all the time, going to the bathroom all the time. What's with the thirst thing? Yeah. What is that about? <laughs> yeah. So when your glucose level goes really high. Ratatouille. Marogena. Marogena is ice. then the concentration of glucose inside of your inside of your uh, blood increases your brain basically says oh wait a minute let's drink more water so that we can flush that glucose out uh -huh. so it's a it's a way that you will take mm -hmm. on more fluid to decrease the concentration of glucose and then eventually pee it out oh das ist schlau das ist ah, jetzt weiß ich auch warum man dann so viel pinkelt auch und so viel trinken will so it's a way of just also ist eigentlich genau das was ich gesagt habe ne nur der Körper sieht das so. Also, ne? Basically getting rid of glucose. Right. All right. Er will das, ja, das ist eigentlich okay. ganz genau das, was ich gesagt habe. So, I was quite familiar with these symptoms because my older brother was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes nine years prior. Und deswegen trinkt man so viel äh, auch, aber man hat das Gefühl, man pinkelt noch mehr aus, als man trinkt. Weil der Körper die ganze Zeit das Signal kriegt, der, der muss das loswerden. Deswegen kriegst du Durst. Hm. So I said to my mom, I think I have type 1 diabetes. She said, no, no, don't be silly. You don't have type 1 diabetes. So she leaves town for a weekend to go check out some places with my dad in Florida because we were going to move to Florida. We're living in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So my mom calls a check-in and she says, how are things going? I said, mom, I couldn't sleep last night. I was cramping. She said, okay, go upstairs, test your blood glucose, and let's see what's going on. So I test myself on my brother's meter. I'm over 400. So four times higher than I'm supposed to be. And my brother says right then and there, yep, you have type 1 diabetes, pack your bag, you're going to be in the hospital for a few nights. So we go to the regular doctor, they make the diagnosis. I see my brother cry for the first time. He's like, oh, I'm just so sorry you have to deal with this. And my parents fly back the next mm -hmm. night. And my dad just said in the hospital, it's an inconvenience. Don't worry about it. You're still going to get to do whatever you want in life. And that was sort of the way I was brought up. I had standard medical care. I went to the Mayo Clinic had an endocrinologist, a psychologist, a dietitian, and looking back, it's really a missed opportunity, I think, to really turn somebody onto a better state of health. Whereas at that point, 
all they were saying is just eat normal. Follow the standard American diet. Just make sure you get every single food group. We want you to feel normal. You're a teenager. Don't let this you know, make you feel weird. That was the focus. And you're at the Mayo Clinic. Yeah, exactly. You right. think, you know, the best care. You know, mm, think they could, they could do a little better. But that's what happened. So life with type 1 begins. I was a competitive tennis player, a type A personality. And mm. I, I took pretty good care of it. You know, I was on top of it. I'd count my carbohydrates. I dosed my insulin properly. Okay, da hat auch Low Carb gemacht. Okay. I'd fill out the logbook. War auf der Mayo Klinik, also sehr renommierte... Uh, Klinik. Okay. Und hat wieder alles falsch gesagt bekommen, was man falsch gesagt bekommen kann. Okay. Very diligently to figure out what to do. Sort of that guidance that you had suggested that, hey, that... that Cutting carbohydrates, hat er gerade gesagt. Okay. I would give, right? So the Mayo Clinic did give that guidance. And I had, you know, pretty good control, but I had lots of other just unfortunate symptoms, like chronic allergies. I would take Nasonex and Claritin D. And still get sick all the time. I had plantar fasciitis, which was very frustrating as a tennis player. I wore these big blue boots at night to try and do passive stretching. Mm -hmm. I had warts on my feet. And in high school, I developed cystic acne. It was really frustrating. I did all the treatments, the creams, the pills, the laser treatments, microdermal abrasion. Eventually, they put me on Accutane. It's like the most serious drug you can possibly take when you have acne. So your parents have to sign a, a waiver because some people have committed suicide on that drug. Mm. So... I had these frustrating uh, symptoms, but I was starting to get into learning about how can I take better care of myself just through some of my, my dad selling supplements. And just, it kind of resonated with me. I just kept on learning a little more, a little more. Hey, try and avoid the MSG, mm -hmm. trying to avoid the additives. It just, it kind of made sense. What was your dad slinging? He was his herb, Herbalife oh, at he first. Was, okay. and he, he's been through <laughs> yeah. many different ones. Right. USANA eventually, uh -huh. a lot of different network marketing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was pretty funny. So in high school, I'm living in Florida at this point, and I stumble across a book called Natural... Ja, mit dem haben die richtig Geld gemacht, ja. Machen ja alle Diabetologen. Die machen sich alle die Taschen voll an den kranken Menschen. Mit Low Carb. Cures, they don't want you to know. Also hast du hundertprozentige Garantie, dass er immer zu dir kommt. Wow. Okay, this is by Kevin Trudeau. We are not recommending this book. This guy got put in jail for fraud. <laughs> do, you, do you remember seeing those commercials? I don't, no. Yeah. Uh, it's like a purple book. He's got his big smiling face on the front. It was, it was crazy. What was, it, what was his pitch? So this book planted a seed in my mind that it would be possible to reverse type 1 diabetes. Uh -huh. And that changed the course of my life. And I said, okay, I'm going to do anything and everything to get my beta cells to work again. That was the mindset. What was his protocol to do that? He honestly, it was just it was like one sentence. It was one sentence in the book that planted the seed. Okay, wait a minute. It wasn't a particular protocol. Right. It, he, it, he didn't it, actually it, tell you how to do no, it. No, no. <laughs> okay. I mean, there was there was all kinds of crazy things like colonics and supplements. But it was just crazy the, stuff. the idea that that could be possible. Yes, was, that's that was like, kind of like opened a door for you. Yes, right. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And my mindset was, hey, people told Roger Bannister you can't run a four minute mile. The smartest people in the world said that's not possible. And then he did it, and now other people can run four-minute miles. So somebody's got to do it first. So I'm like, I will do anything and everything. So this leads me to try the Western A. Price Foundation, which is a diet where you're eating lots of grass-fed beef, you're having raw milk. I would go to the local farmer's market and buy milk for a cat because you couldn't sell raw milk to a human. So I was willing to do anything. It was crazy right. stuff. And learning the information, like each step along the path, like it made sense. It's like, okay, that's interesting. That's interesting. I'll try this. I'll try that. Grass-fed beef, yeah, probably better than the beef from the factory farms and stuff like that. So I did the Weston A. Price Foundation diet. I didn't see any big difference in my diabetes health. So I continue to learn. Eventually, I come across a plant-based ketogenic diet. So this guy, Gabriel Cousins, had right. a movie called mm -hmm. Raw for 30 Days. Mm -hmm. And this is a diet where you eat lots of greens, lots of vegetables, but you're getting your calories from nuts and seeds and oil. So I started trying that. And of course... Oh my. Gott. Alter, der ist da an jeden geraten, an dem man nur geraten kann, ey. Oh mein Gott. Now I'm removing carbohydrates from my diet. My total insulin use is coming down. And I'm saying, wow, this is working. That's my goal. I want to take... Da hast du es. Ne? Kohlenhydrat rausgenommen und schon, es funktioniert. Nur da gibt es ein kleines Problem, das er wahrscheinlich gleich erzählen wird. Take less and less insulin. Und das ganz genau diesen Trick benutzen auch die Studien, Low-Carb-Studien, die zeigen, dass man 
dass Low Carb hilft bei Diabetes. Genau deswegen erzählt er gerade. But in hindsight, that only makes sense if you know the beta cells in your pancreas are simultaneously starting to make their own insulin. Mm -hmm. But that clearly wasn't the case in hindsight. Mm -hmm. So I'm following that diet and I'm at the University of Florida this time. I'm a freshman and I'm on campus and I black out several times. It's just really scary, that moment. Like you just kind of need to pause and be like, wait a minute, what's going on? I need to like regroup, get home, rest. Just hypoglycemic. I mean, I don't know exactly. I mean, yeah, it probably was a little bit, but I think I was just low energy. Uh -huh. So I go back to my naturopath. <laughs> low energy. This auf einer ketogenen Ernährung und fällt mehrmals in Ohnmacht. Uh, weil low energy, ne? sein Körper schaltet ab, er kann einfach nicht mehr. Er bricht zusammen. Low energy. Uh, kommt davon, wenn man keine Energy ist. I'm like, what's going on here? Like, what can we do? And she's like, okay, you know what? Maybe you should do some chelation therapy. Maybe that'll help you get rid of some heavy metals and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, you know what? I'll drive from Gainesville. I'll go all the way to Tampa and I'll try this therapy. I'll do any modality. I'll do anything. I mean, I also, I flew to San Jose, California and met with a Chinese medicine man. He made me this herbal tea. Uh -huh. I was drinking that in college. It smelled so bad that I would brew it outside on, uh -huh. the, uh, on the sidewalk <laughs> with like a portable... I'm not a stranger to that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. He had everything done. Heiliger. And I mean, Been there, done that. He, the guy had worked magic for my father and some injuries he had, like put some like, peanut butter stuff on his arm and like, mm. it was crazy. But uh, I didn't really see again any specific results with my diabetes health. So I'm considering all my options, trying all this stuff. But before I commit to the chelation therapy, I hear Doug Graham on a podcast. And this is in September of 2006. And he's talking about, you know, this fruit-based diet also being able to help you get rid of heavy metals and clean, cleanse your body. Like, this is a healthy thing to do. I'm like, you know what? I'm missing fruit. I would love to eat some fruit again. I don't want to do this expensive chelation therapy. Let me try this. So I started dabbling a little bit. The book finally comes out in December of 2006. I read it straight through. And Cyrus is one of the testimonials in the back. Mm. I'm like, wow, this is interesting. The 80-10-10. Yes, he's right. one of the testimonials in there. So I start Googling a little more about Cyrus. Find some pictures of him online. He was talking to me early. <laughs> <laughs> he's like looking fit. I'm like, oh, this is cool. This is encouraging. I'm going to try this. So I started working with Doug Graham. I email him every single day for 90 days straight. He emails me back every day for 90 days straight. And I learn how to do this fruit-based living. And this is again around Christmas time. I remember going down to eat Christmas dinner. I have a pyramid of bananas, you know, like five on the bottom, then four, then three. <laughs> My family just looking and laughing like this is going to be another phase. They'd seen me go yeah. through so many things. And now we're, we're 13 years later. Yeah. It's not a phase. I mean, if you if you follow. Hmm. Auch durch Doug Graham, krass. Junge, Junge, da hat der Doug Graham aber Menschenleben gerettet. Crazy. Robbie on Instagram. <lacht> I'm like, what? Weil er im, in, im Radio gehört hat auf einer Keto-Sitzung. Das ist krass, ey. Wow, like that is so, like this, this is like, first of all. Ja, Gott wollte, dass er weiterlebt, wie es aussieht. Like the, the amount of attention and like diligence that you put into like preparing all of this, you create like these sort of performance art installations sure, sure. out of yeah. the food. Ja, das habe ich, das habe ich durchaus. Die Berichte sind auch alle hochgeladen. Die meisten, viele haben es natürlich einfach nicht gesagt oder so, aber ich habe schon so einigen das Leben gerettet, ja. Das ist nice. You, but it's like, it's just, it's like, das ist ein krasses Gefühl, wenn Menschen einem sowas schreiben. All raw fruit. It's fun. Yeah, yeah and it, it looks like a lot of food, but I always tell people it's a lot of water and it's a lot of fiber. So it's a little deceptive. Yeah, like the volume. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I start doing this diet and just like Cyrus, you would expect you need to use way more insulin. Your blood glucose should be way more difficult to control. And that's not what happened. My insulin sensitivity improved by over 600%. So <laughs> Auf High Carb, 600%. Anstieg der Insulinsensitivität. Liegt vielleicht daran, dass Insulin nur arbeiten kann mit Zucker. You can calculate that by taking a 24-hour insulin sensitivity ratio. You take your total carbohydrate consumption, divide that by your total insulin use, and you get a ratio there. Mm -hmm. So when I was doing the plant-based ketogenic diet, it was three to one, 30 grams of carbohydrate per day, one unit of insulin. Now it's no. well over- 30 grams 30, of carbohydrate per day. One unit of insulin. No, no, sorry, 10 units of 10 insulin. Units of insulin. Sorry, 10 yeah. units of insulin, which gets you to a three to one ratio. That's what I was using, 10 units of insulin. 
Sorry. So, yeah. so then now I'm, if the ratio is 22 to one, I'm eating over 750 grams of carbohydrate per day and injecting roughly 27 units. So it's mm -hmm. over 22 to one, that's over 600% mm -hmm. improvement in insulin sensitivity. And this just gets me really excited. So I'm in college, I decided to start looking up some research, looking into this, Neil Barnard's information's out there, Dr. McDougall's information. Oh, 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 <laughs> da kommt der McDougall in sein Leben. Und dann ging's los. That leads me to the original studies. And just like Cyrus, I find this information has been out there for almost 100 years. That if you yeah. eat more carbohydrate-rich food and limit the fat consumption, you improve the function of insulin. Insulin resistance is caused by a high-fat diet. So it was really transformative. All my symptoms went away. Plantar fasciitis, gone. My skin starts to clear up. I'm not using any more medications, no more creams. I don't take any allergy medications. I don't get sick. No more warts on my feet. And I'm feeling energetic again. Re wow, hört euch das mal an. Huh? Das ist so krass. Uh. Really excited about life at this point. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to... The, the why was really strong. Again, I'm doing all this stuff because I'm trying to get my beta cells to work again. So I'm like, okay, this is going to help my body rest and rejuvenate and heal the cells. Maybe my stem cells can make some new beta cells. Mm -hmm. Und du isst Pflanzen und alles wird besser, ne? Wer hätte das gedacht? I wish it was that simple. It's a little more complicated. But that was the mindset. So I was just really stoked about life. Okay, let's just keep doing this. Let's keep doing this. Let's keep optimizing the insulin sensitivity, eating really well, getting just a nutrient-dense diet, and let's see if we can get the beta cells working again. So mm -hmm. that was the mindset. And you've essentially just built on that ever since, right? I mean... Are you eating any vegetables at all at this point? I eat lots of non-starchy vegetables and lots of greens. Yeah, true. Right. Big time. So it's not entirely a fruitarian diet. Correct. It's not a, it's not a Michael Arnstein. Yeah, we're not advocating a fruitarian, a fruitarian diet. fruitarian, no. pure diet. And, and have you found, like, do you do, we're kind of skipping ahead here a little bit, but like, are you supplementing at all? Like, are you worried about your omega-3s and your DHA and, D, and like all that other kind of stuff? So like how does that all work? Uh, as far as omega-3s, essential fatty acids, I do not supplement. And we actually covered this thoroughly in the book. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of confusion when it comes to essential fatty acids. So the two essential fatty acids are LA on the omega-6 side and ALA on the omega-3 side. And getting enough ALA is not that difficult. I mean, you can get it just by eating enough calories. So, but if you want an insurance policy... Get some nuts and seeds. Ja, du kriegst das, wenn du genug Kalorien isst. Ha. Die äh, essentiellen Fettsäuren. Ah, wer hätte das gedacht? Alter, hey. Das kommt mir so vor, als hätten die beide meine Videos geguckt. Das ist eins zu eins, was ich erzähle. Eins zu eins. Hm. Well, if you have one tablespoon of... Ja. Menschen haben zu mir schon gesagt, ohne Öl kann man nicht überleben. Da habe ich gefragt, was hat man gemacht, als es noch kein Öl gab. You know, flaxseed or one tablespoon of chia seeds, ideally ground up. You already meet your requirements for ALA. Uh -huh. And right yeah, then and there. to your point, if you have some nuts and seeds, that's going to increase your ALA yeah. intake, no question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the issue is the conversion process. So people are consuming too many omega-6 fats, which is inhibiting the conversion. The same right. enzyme, delta-60 saturase, starts the conversion process on both sides. So if you're eating too much omega-6 fats, it's going to prefer that pathway. And it's going to focus on doing the conversion on that side. And there's not enough enzymes left over to do the conversion on the ALA mm -hmm. side to can take the omega-3s and make EPA and DHA. Right. So in the book, we talk about an N of 2 study, which is our own personal results. And you can get this quantified through an omega quant test. And you can see what is your essential fatty acid status inside the membranes of your cells. And our numbers are extraordinary. I mean, mine was over 8%, Cyrus is over 7%, and people who are supplementing, people who are eating excess nuts and seeds, they're roughly around 4% and they're mm -hmm. happy with that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. Muss man aber auch nicht machen, das ist alles äh, Augenwischerei. Sich mit sowas zu beschäftigen, äh, habe ich, wie ist mein Ratio Omega-3, Omega-6, habe ich genug äh, ALA, DHA, EPA und so ein Zeug, also das ist alles Augenwischerei. Sagt ja auch selbst. Du erreichst alles, wenn du genug Kalorien isst. Das ist, äh, es, gab, es gibt kein Problem damit. Einfach essen wie ein Mensch, ne? wie ein Pflanzenfresser. Right, so both you guys have this epiphany. 
and it flies in face in the face of all this conventional wisdom that you got to go low carb. You're eating this unbelievably high carbohydrate diet. Mm -hmm. um, how are you like when you go to the doctor? Like what are the what are the what are your your doctor saying at this? Und da müssen alle lachen, ey. Ja, mit dem Wissen jetzt, ne? Was was sagt ihr, wenn ihr zum Doktor geht? Der ja alles genau falsch rum sagt. At this point early on. My endocrinologists have never even asked. They don't really? look in the details. They say, you know, wow, your A1C is great. Your insulin use is fine. You don't have any complications. Just 10 minutes. I'm eating out, write my prescriptions, right. and that's it. So they're not even really diving into I've what it is that you're doing. three different endocrinologists over the past 13 years of following a low-fat, plant-based whole food diet. Uh -huh. Oh, they macht low-fat. <laughs> single one of them knows exactly what I eat. They've never asked. They don't, oh, they don't ask. So I don't need to tell them. Right. What about uh, you, Cyrus? Yeah, the, the, when you go to an endocrinologist's office, um, the, the like currency that they. Ich meine, die, die fragen nicht mal, was sie essen. Die sehen diese unfassbaren Werte, ne? die besten Werte, die man als Typ 1 Diabetiker haben kann. Die fragen nicht mal, wie die das hingekriegt haben. Also die wollen, da, die wollen davon gar nichts wissen, weil ansonsten ne, könnte das irgendwie noch verbreitet werden, dass man das so leicht ja, unter Kontrolle kriegen kann. Und dass er genau das Gegenteil ist von dem, was die machen, deswegen fragen die nicht mal nach. Huh. Ask you for is your blood glucose meter or your CGM. So they take a device from you, they then download the information from that mm -hmm. device and they look at numbers and they say, okay, your time and range was this, highs, lows, okay, your A1C is doing this. Okay, great. Here's my prescription for you. Change your insulin dosing strategy, don't change something like that. Nowhere in that conversation does food enter into the picture. Ist so? Beim Diabetologen, es gibt sowas nicht wie Ernährung. Es, es ist ein relevantes Thema. Man kann es im Kopf nicht aushalten. I had the opportunity to bring it up once with uh, one of my endocrinologists and the response that I got was like, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I guess a, a plant-based diet works for some people. And I was like, mm, okay, fair enough. You know, like right. I didn't want to get into it, but I was like, all right, I, I understand. You know, but for the most part, just like Robbie's saying, 90 plus percent of all people's, you know, doctors, again, they're not trained in diet. That's just not part of their tool set and therefore it doesn't even come up. Right. But again, I think if there was a problem, they would take the time to look into it. There just hasn't been a problem. Gotcha. All right. So we talked about what type. Und du hast ja dann gesagt, dass sie keine Ahnung hat. Was hat die dann gesagt? <laughs> One is. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit more about what type two is. Let's let's kind of define our terms. Mm -hmm. um, distinguishing type two from <clears throat> pre-diabetic, from insulin resistant, and also type 1.5, which I'd never heard about until I was listening to you guys talk about it. Mm -hmm. Researchers believe there's more people living with type 1.5 diabetes than type one. What is that? <laughs> It's okay. a slow onset version of type one. Okay, so so let's start. Let's it's it's gonna be very confusing. So okay. let's just think of like diabetes as being like a general umbrella term for like what could have the thing that you get when your blood glucose becomes variable, right? Within that umbrella, you have many different things, many different flavors. We'll call them right. So you have the type one, which is Ravi and me. So it's an autoimmune condition, like we described earlier, and generally it's considered a strong autoimmune condition, which means that. You express at least one, sometimes mul mul most of the time, multiple antibodies to the beta cells. And as a result of that, it's a rapid destruction, happens within 12 to 18 months, and then you go to full insulin dependence. And that can affect kids as low, mm -hmm. you know, from the age of, from birth all the way up to the age of about 30. There's another type of autoimmune diabetes, which affects adults greater than the age of 30. Just nach 30 Jahren kriegst du keinen Diabetes Typ 1 mehr. 30 who also get an autoimmune reaction, but it's a weaker autoimmune reaction. So rather than having multiple antibodies to the beta cells or to insulin, they usually only express one. It's not a hard Ah, okay. Also 1,5 kannst du kriegen. Fast rule, but generally only one. So as a result of that, type 1.5 diabetes is considered adult onset, adult onset, slow progressing mm. type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, over the age of 30, there's people who are now in their 60s that are getting that are diagnosed with autoimmune diabetes. It's type 1.5. Mm. Okay. The third type of diabetes is called pre-diabetes. Think of pre-diabetes as like baby type 2 diabetes. So it's the thing that you get on the way to type 2. 
And uh, like we were talking about earlier, insulin resistance is the underlying condition that first sets in, and then insulin resistance progresses to prediabetes. You know that you have prediabetes because you go to the doctor, you get your A1C value measured, and or your fasting glucose, and or your fasting insulin, and those numbers usually are showing a slight elevation. So as a result of that, you get this diagnosis of prediabetes, but usually people are given the warning like, hey, if you make some lifestyle changes right now, you can go back to being non-diabetic. Right. It's your choice. Was hast du dann gesagt? Ich esse keinen toten Tiere? Dann hat er bestimmt ein Gesicht gezogen wie ein Pferd. If prediabetes progresses and continues to get worse and the amount of insulin resistance that you're experiencing grows, then it turns into type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes occurs when Again, you are you are quite insulin resistant. Glucose levels are quite high. You know, like fasting glucose, postprandial or postmeal blood glucose is high, and um, the amount of insulin that your pancreas is secreting, okay, in this progression goes from being normal to high in the pre-diabetic state. So your your pancreas is like trying to to control your blood glucose. Like I, I can secrete more. I can secrete more. So pre-diabetics usually have a high fat, uh, insulin level. And then by the time you get to type 2 diabetes, the ability of those beta cells to continue to manufacture insulin has been compromised. So now instead of having a high insulin production, you go back to having a, a compromised insulin production. Okay, so it's like you started out at normal, you went into overdrive, and then boom, now you fell. Right. You didn't fall to zero right. usually, but you fell to like, you know, suboptimal, 50%, 60% normal insulin production. That's when type 2 sets in. And at that point, the question really becomes, is it possible to go from type 2 back to prediabetes, back to non-diabetic? And if so, how would you do it? And the answer is absolutely. It can happen in more than 80%, sometimes even 90% of all mm -hmm. cases. The question is, what are the lifestyle choices that you put into play to make that happen? Right. And that's a complex question right. because, you know, there's so many different types of, there's so many different worlds saying, I know the answer, I know the answer, I know the answer. But the idea is, in general, generality speaking, Yes, you can move from type 2 back to non-diabetic, and it happens for the majority of people. And I want to get into <clears throat> that solution, but before we do that, maybe we should talk a little bit about cause. I mean, when I was a kid, it wasn't even type 1 and type 2. It was like mm. adult-onset diabetes yeah. and juvenile That's diabetes, right. Right. right? And I didn't know anybody that had what we now commonly refer to as type 2, but we're in a situation at the moment where I think the statistics are something, I mean, you would know much better than me, but we're verging on like 30% of Americans being, of adult Americans being diabetic or pre-diabetic. Right. And, and the childhood rates are insane as well. I mean, where are we at the moment? Yeah, okay. So the statistics say by 2030 that one in three people in the United States will be living with some form of diabetes. It's insane. Okay, let's do the math on that. How many people well, in the United States? Well, I mean, States? we already have one third with pre diabetes is 85 million people just don't know it. Correct, correct. So, so what the statistics are saying is that by 2030, so let's fast forward 10 years from now, there's gonna be a massive diabetes problem with one out of every three people walking around saying, I have diabetes, I have type two diabetes mainly, right? But what Robbie's saying, which is absolutely right, which is that today, in 2020, there are 30 million people approximately in the United States that have been diagnosed with some form of diabetes. Und die Ärzte werden sagen, das liegt daran, dass sie alle viel zu viele Früchte essen. So about 1 to 3 million of those have type 1 and then the other 27 to 33 million have type 2. <coughs> um, in addition to those people, there are now 85 million other people who are living with prediabetes but don't even know it. Mm. Yeah. Right? So the total number is somewhere about 110 million people who are living with some form of blood glucose instability, blood glucose variation problem, and majority of them don't even know it. And those are the people that over the course of the next 10 years are going to likely progress to type 2 diabetes, causing a huge, you know, an even larger epidemic than we're facing now. And the cause is standard American diet and not enough exercise and living stressful lives, essentially. Excess calories, excess saturated fat in the diet, not enough exercise, high stress, no questions. Mm -hmm. And the solution. With the diet being the biggest problem of all yeah. of them. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. Um, all right, well, let's talk about the solution. So um, we, already kind of, we already kind of, you know, waded into it a little bit here. 
Um, but you guys are coaching people. You've got this book, Mastering Diabetes, and it's essentially you've created this protocol to say, look, we're N of two, but here's what the research says. Here's what the science says. Mm -hmm. um, here's how we can hold your hand and walk you through this process and get you from your type two diabetic state or your pre-diabetic state and walk it back. Yeah, at N of two and also 3,000 plus people who've been through our coaching right. program. Uh -huh. And like you said, a lot of research. There's over 800 plus citations in that book. And kind of the research goes back. It goes back all the way to the 1920s, showcasing that the more carbohydrate food you eat, the lower your insulin resistance goes. So, I mean, insulin was first discovered in 1921. Then it was first used in humans in 1922. So the, around this time, that's when the whole conversation starts to emerge about, okay, insulin sensitivity. So 1926... Dr. Sansom publishes a paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association called The Use of High-Carbohydrate Diets in Treating Diabetes. And this is the first time that he said, I used a radical experiment in 150 patients, adding bread, potatoes, fruit, and low-fat milk. All right? That's what he adds. And he finds that his patients don't need to use more insulin. So prior to the discovery of insulin, they were fed a very, very low carbohydrate diet, very high in fat, very high in protein, just to keep people alive. So that's what was going on. They were having like 400 calories a day. It was miserable. Nobody liked the food. They couldn't think clearly. They had no energy. So Dr. Sansom feeds them this higher carbohydrate diet, and all of a sudden, they return to physical activity. They return to their normal mental capacity. The diet actually tastes good. And this is just the beginning. Then in the 1930s, Dr. Rabinowitz in Canada starts practicing a higher carbohydrate diet with his patients, publishes several papers. In 1935, he publishes a paper, which is a five-year randomized controlled trial in 100 people. 50 people try the old low-carbohydrate diet. 50 people try the new higher-carbohydrate diet, okay? He sees a 1% reduction in insulin use on the old diet and a 57% reduction in insulin use on the higher-carbohydrate diet. Whoa. Okay, I mean, he actually, I actually brought a few statements here. Diet, 50 people. In the 1930s, Dr. Rabinowitz in Canada starts practicing a higher carbohydrate diet with his patients, publishes several papers. In 1935, he publishes a paper, which is a five-year randomized controlled trial in 100 people. 50 people try the old low-carbohydrate diet. 50 people try the new higher-carbohydrate diet, okay? He sees a 1% reduction in insulin use on the old diet and a 57% reduction in insulin use on the higher carbohydrate diet. Whoa. Okay. I mean, he actually, I actually brought a few statements here to read. He concludes carbohydrates increase, whereas fats decrease the sensitivity of the individual animal and man to insulin. This is 1935. Just researchers clearly stating fat consumption impairs insulin sensitivity. Then at the same time, you have Dr. Hemsworth in the United Kingdom. He's publishing very fancy studies in people who do not have diabetes. So he wants to test in normal human subjects what's going on with insulin use depending on what type of diet I feed them. So he gets a bunch of healthy young male medical students. He feeds them seven different diets for the minimum of seven days. All right, the high fat diets, 80% of calories coming from fat. Low fat diet is 16% of calories coming from fat, okay? And he sees that there's a stepwise improvement in insulin sensitivity as he decreases the fat in the diet. You got seven different diets over seven different, this very, very thorough experiment. He concludes that study saying, the greater the amount of carbohydrate in the diet, the greater the sensitivity of the organism to insulin. Again, this is 1935. Wow. People are saying this. And then you skip to like the work of Walter Kempner, 1958. Do you remember his work? I mean... Refresh fruit juice. Memory, no. Okay, he's feeding people white rice, uh -huh. fruit juice, fruit, and white sugar. This is a diet of less than 5% of calories come from fat, a very highly processed. It was originally designed to treat hypertension. Okay, so he publishes a paper. He's like, he got great results. He was reversing heart disease, kidney disease, all kinds of stuff. He was even skeptical what's going to happen if I feed this diet to people living with diabetes. Yeah, über seine Ernährung, die Rice Diet, habe ich ein Video gemacht. So he publishes a paper on 100 consecutive patients, no cherry picking, and they're eating all these processed foods, their fasting blood glucose drops, their insulin levels drop, their cholesterol drops, and their weight drops. 
eating processed, high carbohydrate rich foods. And what's amazing and, is that the four foods that he would fed people, mm -hmm. fruit, fruit juice, white rice, white table sugar. These are mm -hmm. literally four of the foods or food groups, I would say, that modern diabetes well, everybody wisdom. Well, everybody's telling you to uh, avoid all of those. I mean, yeah. we vilified fruit, but, you know... It genau, das, das, was er den Patienten gefüttert hat und sie von Diabetes befreit hat, das ist ganz genau das, was Diabetologen sagen, was Diabetes auslöst. The other ones seem a little, even more like, yeah, of course you're not supposed to do that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, has anybody ever studied what would happen if you put a diabetic on, like, just... They just drink Coca Cola and eat candy, like just like pure table sugar. Or okay, high fructose corn I'm gonna syrup. answer that question like, right now. No fruit, no Listen. fiber, just yeah. like I can't believe you just asked that question. Just yeah. lined it up as if we talked to him beforehand. 1971, Dr. Brunzel publishes a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. He feeds people a sugar water diet, literally dextrose and a little bit of protein powder. 85% of calories coming from carbohydrate. 15% from protein, 0% from fat, because it's a processed diet. When you eat a Really? That's is, that's that's is something interesting. Whole food diet, you can't eat 0% fat. There's fat in lettuce, there's fat in bananas, mm -hmm. there's fat in apples, there's fat in everything you eat. You just eat enough whole food, you're gonna get like six, seven, eight percent of calories coming from fat. So he feeds people this highly processed diet. So he had them on a control diet, there were 22 subjects. 13 of them had pre-diabetes, the rest did not have diabetes, okay? Puts them on a control diet for seven to 10 days, and then he feeds them the sugar water diet. Their fasting blood glucose levels drop. 8% in the non-diabetics, 9.6% in the people having the pre-diabetes. But more importantly, he does a paired oral glucose tolerance test. So this is where subjects are given a glucose challenge, like 75 grams of carbohydrate and like a liquid solution. And they're gonna measure the blood glucose levels at every 30 minutes, and insulin levels every 30 minutes for the next two to three hours. And he finds that on the sugar water diet, the blood glucose values went down and their insulin levels went down. So they're eating liquid sugar water requiring less insulin with low... So New England Journal what would happen if you... So how come you're not just like eating candy so, all the time? Well, I mean, we this, did, but... <laughs> <laughs> that, well, the point is, is because it's this is just the biology of what's happening. Uh -huh. But as far as long-term health, overall health, you know, your gut microbiome, of course you want to have nutrient-dense foods that also happen to be low in fat. Right. Okay, but there's still one, there's a couple more studies that I think are... <laughs> Alter, brutale Sachen gibt es. Die haben es tatsächlich getestet bei Diabetikern, haben den äh, Zuckerwasser gefüttert, also original Wasser mit weißem Zucker und es hat funktioniert. Insulinsensitivität hat zugenommen davon. Alter. Worth noting, but 1979. That's ja ganz genau der Punkt. That's ja ganz genau der Punkt. That's ja 0% fat. Yeah. Tell about this. this 1979. This is mind blowing. James W. Anderson. He conducts a study at the University of Kentucky with Kyleen Ward. They take 20 subjects who are all living with type 2 diabetes for a minimum of two years. He puts them on a control diet, you know, the standard diet. I think it was like 40% of calories from fat or so. And then they put them on a weight maintaining high carbohydrate diet. So this is not weight loss can be attributed to any success here. And in 16 A weight maintaining, also die müssen ihr Gewicht halten. Days, 50% of the subjects require zero insulin. So these are individuals that have been using insulin. Ah, die wurden befreit von von Diabetes. Insulin for two years. Yes, they all had this. high fasting blood glucose levels. They were straight up type 2 diabetics. And then he just switches them to a diet that he had, and he forces them to eat enough food so they don't lose a single pound. And within 16 days, call it two weeks, they're off insulin altogether. And what were they eating specifically? It was a lot of starch, high carbohydrate starch. Potato. <laughs> oh my God. Wer hätte das gedacht? Was haben die gegessen, um sich von Diabetes zu befreien? Stärke. Stärke. Oh mein Gott, das ist der beste Podcast, den ich je gehört habe. Ey. That was rice, things like that. Bread, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Wow. Percent of calories was 9% of calories coming from fat on that diet. Mm. So the, as we go into the biochemistry, which I know we're going to have Cyrus talk about, you'll understand why the low fat component is so important. So let's talk about what happens conversely. On ja, das sind ein paar nette Studien, über die Sie berichten. Hi Ridora, schon lange, vor zwei Stunden. 
carb, high fat diet, which is kind of the reigning protocol for. Ice is doch ein Aufputschmittel. People that have this condition, It is. either ketogenic or very low carbohydrate. You can't sure. talk about diabetes and not talk about the ketogenic diet. A hundred percent, no question about it. Okay, so let. Ja, Leute, sollen wir das irgendwann anders weiter gucken? Das Stream wird langsam viel zu lang. Also wir müssen auch irgendwann mal. Wir können das genau an der Stelle weiter gucken, weil ihr seht, wir sind nicht mal bei der Hälfte. Also, ja, geil, geiles Video, ey. heiliger Bimbam. Lass mal sowas von original geil. Ich muss auch schon aufs, auf Toilette pinkeln. Und den nee, nicht heute Abend, einen anderen Tag. Und äh, wir gucken das irgendwann anders.